is a short one. It comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. After this, the Lord chose another 72 men and sent them out two by two to go ahead of him to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, There is a large harvest, but few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we come to the end of a four-week sermon series based on insurance slogans. Maybe you're glad to be done with this one. The first week we said get a piece of the rock and talked about Jesus being the solid rock, listening to his word and doing it is the solid rock you can build your life on. Then we had like a good neighbor and told the story of the Samaritan who helped someone who was in need while the holy people passed him by. Last week it was you're in good hands and we talked about a passage from Isaiah, where it says that God has inscribed us on the palm of his hands, tattooed us in a sense, so that we will never be forgotten or forsaken. And today we go to think progressive. Progressive is a loaded word, isn't it? How many of you heard progressive and thought about Flo, the saleswoman, maybe Bigfoot getting his picture taken in the wilderness? Or how many of you thought, uh-oh, think progressive. Here we come with a liberal agenda. But it's not the meaning that we're looking at today. The word progressive actually means something that is happening or developing gradually or in stages and proceeding step by step. Progressive insurance is usually not as well known as the others, other than Flo has made it pretty well known. But it's not a new company. It was actually founded in 1937. And in 1956, they found their niche within the insurance industry because you know what they started doing then that nobody else would do? They would insure risky drivers. Other companies would get out their actuarial tables and look at someone's history and say, nope, you're not going to get insurance from us because you're too big a risk. Progressive found that if they serviced the people who others considered to be too big a risk, they got a lot more customers that way and in the grand scheme of things made money which is sort of what insurance companies do. But they were also the first company in the insurance world to have a website. The first to have a website and the first to offer insurance premiums to be offered and contracted and paid for online. And besides that, they have those cute little cars. You remember the progressive cars that were all over the place? They were called immediate response vehicles. Big difference in the way things had happened. If you've ever filed an insurance claim, you know what the difference is between having to make a call or get online and set up something and having a car pull up when you are at your greatest need. Well, I want you to think of Philip, the disciple of Jesus Christ, as a first century immediate response vehicle. Because here he is in this story and this is during those early days of the church in Acts where people are being given different jobs because it's bringing in a lot of different sort of people, the church, the new church, the way as they called it then. It's bringing in people who had not been Jews before as well as people who had been Jews their whole lives. And it's mixing them all up. It's taking people from different socioeconomic groups and putting them in the same place. And some of the people who had been waited on all their lives were expecting to be waited on in the context of the church and instead they're told that they have to divide up jobs and they're all given jobs and they get into squabbles. Some people are beginning to hide a little of their assets because they don't like this communal living idea that's coming from the early church that you share what you have with others. They don't like that at all and so some of them are lying and they're going to have some difficult situations there. But we're also coming to a time of great persecution. This is around the time that Stephen will become the first martyr as Paul watches Paul the good Pharisee that he was, who has been given instruction and permission from the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem to go out and to arrest these people and to drag them into Jerusalem against their will, where they will be tried and most likely executed for their faith in this guy, Jesus the Christ, as they called him. So a lot is going on in the church. And do you remember the first chapter of Acts is Jesus' ascension? Before he goes, he says to them, you will be my witnesses. This is one of my 
passages that I go to again and again and again in Scripture. You will be my witnesses. Not you may be my witness. Not you have within you the potential to be my witnesses. Not that if you get your act together, I'll let you witness for me. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses where? Here in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Samaria, a place that they had been taught to avoid their whole lives, and this is where they're going to be sent. So the angel of the Lord says to Philip, get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. And he comes upon an Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopian. He's from Africa. So he has a different race. He is known to be a eunuch because apparently the process for making him a eunuch has altered his appearance in some way and that could have been a higher voice or a more feminine sort of countenance upon him but it was obvious what he did and it's obvious and it's noted in the story he comes upon this man who is reading a scroll and he is the treasurer for the Candace the queen of Ethiopia this is a slave certainly because no one ever puts on their dreams for the future I want to grow up and become a eunuch and be a slave for a queen. But he is entrusted with a great deal of her wealth. And also he has some wealth of his own because we know that because he is reading a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. People did not have Bibles all over their house in those days. They didn't have the scrolls. That was something only a person of great wealth or statue could have. And he's struggling to understand from Isaiah another of the servant songs. This one, The Suffering Servant. You've all heard this one read You've heard me read it here last year online because we were not worshiping during Lent. But the passage from Isaiah that we associate with Lent, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch asks Philip, who is this written about? And the most wonderful thing happens. We don't get to hear his explanation. We don't hear because we're all leaning in, especially those of us who interpret Scripture for others as a living, to see what message the Holy Spirit is going to give him to give to this man who's struggling to understand the Word of God. All we know is he takes this as an opportunity, an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with this man. And Philip begins to speak. Starting with the Scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And they're going along the road because he has been sent to this man to go along the road. Remember I said he is the first early response, immediate response vehicle. He is there with the man and the man says, look, there's water. Now this is another strange thing that is only happening because God is allowing it to happen. Because they're in the wilderness. You've got to remember, this isn't the wilderness of Baltimore County. This is the wilderness where water was a scarce commodity and it would have probably been an oasis of some sort where people would have gathered. But he says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? I would love to have somebody walk up to me and say, preacher, what is there to prevent me from being baptized? My only answer, the, the only thing that would prevent someone from being baptized is if he or she had been baptized before. Because it's one per customer, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Sometimes people will say, but I don't remember mine. And I always say to them the same thing, but Jesus Christ does. Because he was there. He's the one who baptized you. The water was put on by someone else's hand, but it was Christ who baptized you. And he says, what is there to prevent me? And we're probably sitting here thinking, not much, but oh, yes, there was. The laws of the Torah. Because you see, a man who was a eunuch, by choice or by force, could not enter the temple. He was considered unclean and cast aside. But remember what Jesus said, you will be my witnesses where? You'll be my witnesses here. You'll be my witnesses in Samaria. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And this man is going to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to Africa, along with the scroll of Isaiah. And he baptizes him. And they come up out of the water, and Philip is snatched away by the Holy Spirit. Because God is no longer bound by human limitations, by time and space. Philip is taken away and sent somewhere else. I think this is the perfect passage for us today. Because what are we doing now but doing church in a brand new way? Remember what the definition of progressive is? Something that is happening or developed gradually or in stages, proceeding step by step. I've told you, I've shared with you that some of the younger pastors in the conference and some newer in ministry have said to me, how do we do ministry in this pandemic? 
tell me how to do this. And I say to them the same thing that I'll say to you right now. I was not here, believe it or not, in 1919. That was the last time the nation went through anything like this. I wasn't here. I can't tell you what we do, but I can tell you that God will lead us through because God leads us through every dark valley there is. God will lead us through this one as well. Remember how I said in the newsletter, I don't want us to look at this as the new normal? Well, it's becoming a temporary normal because we do have to do things differently. But what is it doing but making the church be the church in a new way? How many years do we sit in our buildings with a steeple hoping someone will trip over the door and come in and see what we're about? How many times do I wait for somebody to come up to me and say, what will prevent me from being baptized instead of going out into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ? Here, there, everywhere, beginning in Cockeysville in Baltimore County, to the places around that you may not want to go that you might not feel comfortable, and to the very ends of the earth. Philip does not let the letter of the law stop him because God in Jesus Christ has sent him with the word of grace for this man. He sits down to him with him and explains the scriptures. How many of you are here because someone took the time in your life to explain the scriptures to you? Because so many times people will read something and they'll think, that leaves me out. I was the chaplain in a psychiatric hospital. St. Elizabeth's Hospital was a federal psychiatric hospital. I can't tell you the number of times I met with patients who had been told by their parents, by their friends, and often by their pastors that what you have done is unforgivable. You are no longer welcome in the family of God. That's a hard message to undo when someone has heard that. But who are we called to go to? We're not called to go down to Hunt Valley Church and try to convince their members to come here. We're not called to charge the gates of faith church. We're not called to go after the Presbyterians. We're called to be the immediate response vehicles for God, to go where the greatest need is, to go with words of hope and encouragement, to go with food if food is what is needed, to go with medicine if medicine is what is needed, which is how the United Methodist Women has spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We're not supposed to be stopped by someone's physical circumstance. We're not supposed to be stopped by someone's race or their ethnicity. We are called to go where we are needed and to sit with people and to explain to them the love and the grace and the peace and the mercy of Jesus Christ because that is what saves people. We're not saved by a church or by membership in a church. We are saved by the grace and the power and the love of Jesus Christ that sends us from this building into the world. Now, there has been such great debate over whether churches should be opened or closed. And I think it's both. The buildings are closed, but the church is open. I can't tell you how many people are worshiping with us right now across the country, perhaps across the world. We've had people who left Epworth years ago who are now worshiping with us again from across the country. We have people who have been members of churches I've served that are checking in to see us as well as their own congregations. We have folks who just every now and then pick a new congregation. Bill Brown worships with us sometimes. He, he bounces around from church to church online. A friend of mine who's a bishop watches us sometimes. We have the ability to reach people that we've never reached before. We have the ability to reach people who feel that their sins are so great that they cannot make themselves walk in these doors, but they can turn us on YouTube and feel the power of God's love reaching to them. And this week we have the weirdest, most wonderful opportunity in the world to reach children and to connect to them. And how many of you have a child who walks around their face in a phone all the time anyway. We're going to get them there because we're going to reach them however we can. And we're going to continue to serve and we're going to continue. We have people bringing food in here now all the time because the Cockeysville Food Pantry is open again. And I encourage you to do that as well. But I encourage you not to stop sharing Christ beyond these walls because that is what we're called to do as the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is what? A people. people. We are the people of God in Jesus Christ. And we are called to go on the road. And we are called to bring people the good news of his saving love. I was in an accident years ago with my parents. And it was before cell phones had been invented. Telephones had been invented, but not cell phones. <laughs> they had to try to walk to find a pay phone to call for help. They had to wait 
for someone to come. And the insurance company was not there. But I can't tell you what it would have been like to have a car pull up that says, think progressive on the side, just to know that someone reached out immediately to meet your need. So I want you all to think of yourselves in a new light as God's response vehicles. You're the immediate response to the needs of the world. And if someone says to you, how do I understand this scripture, and you don't know, say, I will take you to someone who does, or invite them to come to church, either online or in the parking lot, or when we are able to gather together again, which we will be inside. Because as Jesus said, there is a big harvest out there, folks, a big harvest. There are so many people who do not know that they are loved, who do not know that they are cherished, who do not know that their sins can be forgiven. And so God is sending you into the harvest not just 72 anymore, not just 12, but everyone who God touches with the Holy Spirit is given the gift, the ability, and the call to go and spread the word of God's redeeming love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.